morning, Lori America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Americans for Prosperity is a sponsor of my show. I talk with them quite a lot. If you heard Emily Seidel on my program on Tuesday, we did a pre-debate show, and I wanted Emily to come back after the debate to see if it met her expectations and the expectations of her grassroots volunteer. If you want to become a member of Americans for Prosperity, head to americansforprosperity.org and become a grassroots activist yourself. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Hugh. How are you? I am terrific. What'd you think? Well, I, I'm sort of dividing my thoughts here into what I think about what I heard from policy and then also the political implications. So from a policy perspective, you know, when we talked earlier this week, I told you that far and away, the voters that we're talking to in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, et cetera, uh, they're concerned about the economy and they wanted to hear what people are going to do about it as candidates for president. And so, you know, kudos to the moderators, I think, for diving right into that issue. It's the issue that we've been hearing about the most. And so they gave candidates an opportunity to talk about it right off the, the bat by asking questions about the economy and Bidenomics and, and how people are struggling with inflation. And I think for their part, the candidates started that part off well, um, too. They they were drawing a pretty clear contrast between what they believe and the Biden economic agenda. And that is what voters have been telling us they wanted to hear about. So it started off well from a policy perspective, but obviously it devolved pretty significantly from there uh, in terms of just the way that the debate uh, went on. Why do you think that happens, Emily? Well, you know, each of the candidates, they're trying to differentiate themselves. And um, at some point, they, they just have to talk over each other, I guess, because of the format or, or, or their inability to get their sound bites in in the short time frame that they have. I mean, it's not a real debate. Um, but, you know, we held 52 watch parties across the country. And um, the, I don't think that there was a real consensus coming out of those 52 gatherings on any clear winners or clear losers. Um, there were a couple of big applause lines on the issues that we've been working on in the grassroots at AFP, uh, on health care, on school choice. For instance, there was a lot of, of, of you know, good talk on those issues uh, before everything devolved. There was strong objection to sending uh, aid, financial aid to Ukraine. But I think this is true for both our grassroots activists and the voters that we're talking to. If you liked somebody going into the night, you think they did okay. If you didn't like somebody, they didn't win you over. I don't think there was any real change. I think more work needs to be done. And frankly, by the end of the night, some of the watch parties were booing at the TV because the debate just devolved into this chaos. People are talking over one another and nobody wants to hear that. And the voters that we've been listening to, they told us that they wanted, they wanted to hear about solutions to the problems that they're facing every day. They didn't want to hear um, what they ended up hearing towards the end of, of the debate. Now, 52 watch parties. Every network goes to a watch party. NBC, I was on Meet the Press last night after the debate. They went to a watch party in Wisconsin. And there is a little bit of movement in some of these because people don't like the fact that the former president is not on the stage and they would like him to answer. I think he, he may come for the third. He may not. I, I don't know. He may come for the fourth or the fifth. I don't know. But, Emily, how would you change the rule set? if you were in the king of the forest, not queen, not duke, not earl? You know, I don't know. It's tough. I, I don't know that these debates uh, have been all that effective. In fact, somebody yesterday told me uh, they, don't, they didn't think that the debate was going to matter. And maybe that's true. I mean, here's the thing. You and I, we think about this stuff every day. I'm sure many of the listeners to your program think about this stuff every day. Voters haven't tuned in yet for the most part. Um, we, we, you know, we've been doing a lot of message research. We are doing a focus group last week, and and a bunch of the participants kept on saying the phrase, uh, "Well, when the primary starts, I'll be focused on," you know, and then they'd go on with their answer. When the primary starts, it's like they're 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 not thinking that we're already in the primary season, and so I was, you know, maybe part of the problem is that these debates are sort of like preseason football. <laughs> Only the most devoted people are hanging on every single play. And there are going to be a lot of those folks that are going to look at the film and pick it apart today. Um, 
but I'm just I'm just not sure that there's a solution, to be honest. Now, I know that AFP does not endorse candidates who are issues driven. Uh, this is a moment at the end of the debate. I'm curious if your watch party approved of Governor DeSantis blowing off the island voting off question, because I thought that was the walk off home run to switch from football to baseball metaphor. When you challenge a moderator over a dumb question, I think you win. Now, it could have been anyone up there because people don't like stunts. They can't pay for their groceries. Gasoline is $6 a gallon in California again. They don't want stunts. They want, to talk, they want people to say, how do I get the gas tax down, right? I mean, how do we get pump price? So did anyone at the watch parties appreciate the blowback from DeSantis at the media panel? Uh, I think overall they did. The watch party where I was, when the moderator started to ask that question, there was sort of a <gasps> kind of moment like, wow, this is going to be interesting. And then it was, he was sort of the adult in the room at that moment. And so, yeah, I think it was, I think that was, that was a good move. Now you have AFP on the ground in Iowa. Iowa is allegedly three states, farmers, pro-life people, and everybody else. And farmers got a, a shout out from Doug Burgum last night because the governor comes from North Dakota. And the pro-life people got a shout out from Ron DeSantis, who's in second place in Iowa, and then everybody else. How did it play? Did you have an AFP watch party in Iowa last night? We did. And one of the things I think was interesting is, you know, uh, a couple of the candidates hit Trump for not showing up on the stage. Uh, I don't know that that landed very well in Iowa, but it did land well in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Folks there shared with me that that some of the reactions from their activists there were, you know, saying things like, I don't know what kind of games Trump is playing by not showing up, but it's not working. Or, um, you know, Trump should be at the debate. It's disrespectful that he doesn't show up. He's running for president of the United States. So there's an interesting contrast between um, the 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 reaction to those kinds of lines in a place like Iowa versus some of the more battleground states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Now, the one I'm most familiar with, New Hampshire. I was in Maine this summer. I drove down, saw Ambassador Haley, drove down, saw Chris Christie doing retail policy. In New Hampshire, they don't vote for you unless you take out their trash. That is basically <laughs> the New Hampshire voter. Do you have a wash party in the Granite State last night? Oh, we did. We did, yeah. And they were, did you uh, get a report from that? Yeah, you know, the uh, the folks up in New Hampshire, a, a lot of what they were reacting to was the foreign policy talk. Um, they are, uh, they, that's where a lot of what I said earlier, the, the concern about um, sending aid to Ukraine got some of the biggest reaction. Now, you know, what's interesting to me about that question. More than half, I mean, like 200 members of the House GOP caucus want to vote for aid for Ukraine. More than half of the Senate GOP caucus want to support aid for Ukraine. Lonnie Chen told me on Meet the Press last night that, in fact, more than half of the Republicans generally don't want to send more aid to Ukraine. What does Americans for Prosperity hear about that? Because I, I do believe that the anti-Ukraine aid people are louder than the pro-Ukraine people. But Nikki Haley made a pretty good answer on why we need to send money to Ukraine. Yeah, I think it's an evolving issue in the grassroots, to be honest, but I do think it tilts a little bit more towards not wanting to send aid to Ukraine than, um, than the latter. What about the fentanyl discussion? Because I do believe the sleeping giant in this room is the border. And I, I think it was, who's sending special forces to the South? Is it Nikki Haley or is it Ron DeSantis? I think it's Ron DeSantis who's sending... Uh, the SEALs to go blow up the cartels. What, did, what did, was the reaction to that? In the Because uh, that's, that's pretty radical. Uh, it is. I, the, um, I, I mentioned earlier that when we're talking to voters at the doors, 55% of them are focused on inflation. But the next most talked about issue is border security, broadly speaking. And a big part of that is because of the fentanyl issue. Um, but it's also just, you know, Republican primary voters, um, they, they, they want people to follow the law. And, uh, and, and so it is an issue that is getting a fair amount of, of talk. But, you know, there are actually four other issues that stood out to the grassroots that I talked to. That, that actually got some good good airtime on the stage last night. 
the national debt, calling out both Republicans and Democrats for the problem. I mean, the grassroots uh, have been deeply concerned about spending in debt for a very long time. We've heard people talking about this before. The question is, who's going to finally execute on it? Emily Sedell, you'll be back. In the meantime, if you want to be part of the activist network that Americans for Prosperity has built, go to AmericansForProsperity.org, sign up, become part of the solution to all of these problems at AmericansForProsperity.org, great sponsor of our program, great organization. Thank you, Emily. I'll be right back. Americans, stay tuned.